So, welcome all. My name is Pans Karagounis. I'm in the final year of my PhD. Let's keep fingers crossed. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so today we welcome our HRI alumna, Margot Tudor. Uh, Margot obtained her Bachelor in History from the University of, of Bristol and also her Master of uh, Research from the same university in Security, Conflict and Justice. And today she's going to present her book, you can see the title here, which builds on her PhD thesis. Uh, you obtained the PhD thesis in 2020, and it was funded by the Economic and Social Research Council. <clears throat> Sorry. And it was awarded the Michael Nicholson thesis prize, and it was also a runner-up for the British International History Group, uh, Michael Dockley. This is first in 2021. I'm just sorry for that. So from 2021 to 2022-3, she was a postdoc research fellow in the University of Exeter. And from that time on, she is also a lecturer in the Department of Politics at City University in London. So the floor is yours. Go. Yeah, thank you so much. This is, this is definitely a fuller room than I expected. Um, but yeah, it feels very much like home turf. Um, I didn't really have an end to my PhD properly here because of the pandemic. So me and Christina were very much in the PhD office one day and the next day not back again until I was clearing out our office a year later and there was a layer of dust over everything. It was slightly upsetting. Um, so it very much feels like this is potentially an interesting full stop or a semicolon or some kind of potential conclusion to um, a wonderful three years um, that I spent um, at HRI. I am um, incredibly, incredibly fond of this institute. Oh, really? <laughs> um, and uh, constantly recommending it to students that I, I now um, am lucky enough to kind of engage with and, and shape their ideas and critiques of humanitarianism and conflict as well. So it feels very much like um, a very warm and fuzzy um, experience to be back here today. And I'm very, very appreciative to Andrew, who is somewhere in the room. I don't know. Um, who may have left the room, which is bad. Um, <laughs> he, uh, who has done, oh, he's coming back in. He's done all the organizing for this and has made things incredibly, incredibly smooth. So very much appreciative of you, Andrew, at the back. Um, and also, yeah, Panos, thank you so much for um, being chair today and for kind of doing some of that questions and answering that will hopefully be the more engaging, interactive portion where I can learn more about what the department is specialising and what the new projects are going to be specialising in, so that's exciting. So yes, I um, am a lecturer in foreign policy and security um, at City St George's. We have a new name, we just merged with a hospital, which is fun, um, and a new thing. So uh, <laughs> so I had to put, change the title literally yesterday. Um, uh, still part of University of London. Um, and this book was published in April 2023, so quite a long time ago now, um, but it's very much still at the core of uh, the building blocks of my future projects um, and my thinking on the history of peacekeeping. So although obviously it's a history, it works with archival sources, it's, it's I, I was trained by historian supervisors, also been trained by Rasheen, lovely Rasheen who um, has shaped also my more interdisciplinary thinking, so hopefully you'll be able to see some of um, those reflections, those historical um, arguments and how potentially they have implications for contemporary international politics and peacekeeping practice more broadly. Um, I am particularly interested in field-based practice, so if any of you are also interested in methods of accessing questions about field-based practice, uh, especially for projects in the past or that kind of thing, very happy to talk methods in the question and answers, that's love for a methods chat. Um, so first things first, I'm going to just provide a brief overview of my book's key interventions and contributions to the scholarship on international rule during decolonization. So that's that period there, 1945 to 1971. And I'm hoping that that will then give us a good building block for me to go into a bit more of some specifics because I use a lot of case studies in my research. And so I very much understand that it's, it's jumping around the world a little bit um, and it's a particular time of history that some of you might not be familiar with, but I definitely think that the conflicts themselves will be recurring or conflicts that you may have studied in a much more kind of protracted sense. So you may be much more familiar with the contemporary sharp end of these conflicts, but 
the origins being in decolonization. And what my workbook specifically tries to do is by questioning how and why peacekeepers, specifically UN peacekeepers, um, at the beginning, the origins of peacekeeping itself, <laughs> how they perceived and interacted with local civilians in particular ways. And so I'm trying to shed light on very granular field based mechanisms through which these international actors negotiated, but also renegotiated as geopolitical crises um, evolved, whilst contested statehood was emerging and whilst the Cold War was also uh, growing. Uh, being created and then escalating throughout mm. this period of decolonization and all of these kinds of complicated geopolitical crises mixing at the same time as very kind of regional local conflicts also having these different political scales that we have to keep aware of and that the peacekeepers try to keep aware of and so as as, as relationships of this kind of domination and suppression shifted during this period of the cold war and decolonization this new UN peacekeeping project won significant diplomatic but also political currency for its frontline role in a series of geopolitically significant conflicts. This currency empowered then field-based actors, UN staff, troops themselves to experiment by innovating global norms, especially as this elasticity of what is the nation state, what is nationhood, what can political organisation look like was in uh, transition, transformation. And these kinds of ideas were being tested by different thinkers, so socialist thinkers, pan-African thinkers, Afro-Asian thinkers, federalist and separatist ideas as well. And I've recently started a project thinking a little bit more about secessionism as well during this period. So this is very much the period of a nation state as a category, as the primary category of international organisations, specifically member states being nations, having to have that membership, member state quality being nations in order to have that access to the protections of international law more broadly was being solidified. So this is very much this process where it was being negotiated. There were alternative ideas of what this organization could look like, especially for those who were decolonizing. So for post-colonial states, that elasticity was at its most moldable at this time. And that's when the UN peacekeepers often kind of are provided entry or welcomed into and become um, intervening forces. But these plans in during decolonization were just kind of these utopian dreams. So the old, I think sometimes we have this conversation about the nation state, like there aren't actually any realistic alternatives. But sovereignty was not monopolized by those in support of the nation state paradigm. National independence was only kind of one of many uh, imagined outcomes at this time. And during this period, alternative forms of self-determination, uh, political enfranchisement were debated by activists across the global south, but also among radical groups within the imperial metropoles. So people who, some of you may have studied London and Paris and New York as being important kind of centres for these discussions about what the world could look like beyond the nation state. And I think those discussions today are obviously very valuable to us. And a lot of these different ideas were obviously competing for traction against one another at the same time. So inevitably leading to hierarchies within anti-colonial movements at the same time. And that's something I'm particularly interested in. It's how these different kind of hierarchies evolve even within anti-racist or anti-colonial spaces during this time. So at this moment of transformation that ignited a lot of these anti-colonial world-making plans, this also provoked a response, this this push for solidifying a liberal internationalism that protected the nation state paradigm that was fundamentally of the ideology that the liberal state was the best way to solidify international security and peace. And that part of this, a key part of this and part of my book is anti-communism. So having the liberal state was the best way to prevent the aggression and expansion of the Soviet state. And that idea was therefore pushed by UN peacekeeping missions that saw anti-communism as a security issue. They were phrasing that limitation of socialism as of communism as actually something that was they were legitimately involved in because communism itself was a threat to world peace. Um, and so UN peacekeeping missions and practices contributed to this silencing. So this wasn't just a process where people were kind of voiceless. There was silence and oppressed in these processes of alternative plans for world making. And there was these imposition through peacekeeping, through UN peacekeeping missions, but also staff of these inflexible frameworks of liberal internationalism that only conceived of member state nationalism 
and anti-communism as the only means of legitimate statehood. So again, leading us to this idea of a hierarchy or a line drawing process between legitimate and illegitimate nationhood. And so better understanding the roots and the politics and the constraints on how these international civil servants, who predominantly were, are the UN peacekeepers that I'm interested in. So rather than just thinking about UN troops, actually also thinking about the decision making level, the power making mid level bureaucrats, um, which is how I end up my title. Um, and thinking of a much more kind of comprehensive understanding of the level of power that these field based officials had in negotiating whilst also being the most, at that time, this new shiny silver bullet solution that could provide um, an intervention in these decolonizing spaces that were threatening and undermining the Western liberal democracy idea of the US supremacy, the end of empire, a lot of these big ideologies that had been reigning until this point becoming threatened and peacekeeping, offering a solution, offering the most popular solution, especially for powers in the West. And so whilst anxieties of an impending third world war, which was very much the Cold War, troubled political elites and communities alike, alike, shared dreams of a liberal global community protected by UN peacekeepers satisfied these kinds of shared calls for a greater international recourse and expertise in these spaces of escalating conflict. So it was actually this transition, rather than it being like nation states responding to conflicts directly in a unilateral way, this multilateralism offering what felt more was much more of a kind of scientific, the science of conflict resolution as being this technocratic process. It was impartial, it was independent. Th these were the kind of marketing tools that were used to make even more legitimate in this time of extreme kinds of ideological conflict. Um, and for diplomats, it felt like the lessons had been learned about collective security after the collapse of the League of Nations. This was very much a new organization. It was after the Second World War, nationalism, had uh, extreme hypernationalism had led to the collapse of the Axis powers. And now we have this kind of conversation about what an international form of response could look like in order to prevent future insecurity. And so this idea, this feel of dread, this real impending sense of doom was behind why so many of these conversations once sought a militarized form of peace, rather than there just being this idea of peace that was pacifist. There was this idea that we need an intervening force, we need peacekeepers who are armed because observers are no longer sufficient. And so using a humanitarian guise, which is what I'm particularly interested in, is this kind of slippage between humanitarian and military identity. It means peacekeepers, the organization set host populations, but also international community expectations of its own rights-based yeah. motivations and interests protected by the peacekeeping staff. So it's very much framing itself as being the liberal benevolent intervention. It's the alternative that they can rely upon. And this therefore leads to a series of difficult dangers because if you're justifying your military intervention with the idea that everyone can trust that you're doing the right thing and you're not creating harm, you're therefore leading to a culture of impunity in a lot of different situations, and especially for an international organization which has not got the same level of social contract or elected officials in the same way as a nation state would. So these unelected mid-level UN officials, often who had been recruited directly from colonial administrations or who had come from uh, the family of the Secretary General um, or were just kinds of other people who are in affiliated or relevant kinds of other similar uh, political or diplomatic spaces. Um, and I define them as being the leadership figures in the field. So those who are making decisions in the field and then reporting upwards to the Secretariat in New York employed this direct access to local politicians, populations and activists to shape a particular kind of governance structure that suited that liberal internationalism. So these kinds of ideas of post-colonial territorial borders, for instance, what kind of governance structure you would set up, how infrastructure looked like. And obviously this is directly relevant for those of you interested in international development. Those different projects that were being developed at that time, who they were employing, and the beginning of this kind of very much NGO collaboration with these UN missions at the time. Um, and obviously throughout that, that's a very technocratic way of framing it. There's this idea that we're specialists in conflict response. We're, we're the ones who are trained, we have expertise, people are creating careers from being part of UN peacekeeping, jumping from one mission to another. 
And so mission practices on the ground entrenched a universalist governing ideology of liberal internationalism, but also paternalism that I argue is a direct continuity from colonial administrations. One reason being because it was the same staff, it was the same people who had run colonial administrations previously. This was the way that they understood governance in spaces of decolonization. These were racialized environments where they felt like law and order needed to be imposed top down and there didn't need to be consensus or collaboration with the population about their self-determination. But also there was very much this understanding of a humanitarian utilitarianism, that everything was in their best interests. They weren't doing it because they were being violent like colonial officials. This was liberal colonialism. This was a civilizing mission. And ultimately the population would benefit. They just had to wait and see. And so we see this a lot of the time that there's this encouragement of a deferral of justice, a deferral of self-determination in peacekeeping that often led to justifications for why certain limitations on civil liberties, human rights, policing in ex excessive manners, militarized responses, and I'm, I'm currently writing a paper on militarized responses to protests. So this level of militarizing interactions with civilians being a heavy part of why that response was so unpopular with so many uh, civilians in these host state environments. And so by shaping and reflecting this dominant Western hegemonic geopolitical order, UN peacekeeping staff themselves who are often neglected, I feel, in our histories um, of international uh, organizations as field-based staff imposed a particular political elite, a technocratic standard of what it was acceptable statehood in this post-colonial moment, and a technocratic standard of what that post-colonial life could even look like for these decolonizing populations. So they were gatekeeping international representation, protections, and also a huge amount of legitimacy of how that conflict was even understood by the international community. I mean, the information production, the knowledge production level of power on that level, going from that leadership figure to New York, huge levels of power on how a conflict is understood more broadly in the world. And so my book tries to rethink these mechanisms, these actual precise mechanisms that happened on the ground so we can better understand how sovereignty itself, this kind of more abstract categories, became felt on the ground, how those were translated. So how debates about sovereignty that were being negotiated by member states in a sort of abstract way were actually translated and went, moved up and down throughout the organisation from spaces in the decolonising global south and then back upwards. And I think this allows us to understand better the, how loci of power that influence these processes of decolonization aren't always in these forums in New York or Geneva or Vienna, like actually trying to decolonize our understandings of the spaces of internationalism, just as much as we do the voices within those forums. There's a lot of, um, this is just a personal rant. There's a lot of recent work, <laughs> this is not in my paper, there's a lot of recent work on international history that makes the argument that because a certain politician or a representative comes from a country that itself is presenting itself as anti-colonial, that those politics are anti-colonial. For instance, if you have a leader from Indonesia, for instance, speaking in the UN, that their words are therefore taken for granted uncritically as therefore being anti-colonial or that that official is anti-colonial. By doing field-based research, by doing the research that I think HCI really encourages, you're actually pushing me on that, like, well, let's think, what are they saying? <laughs> what is this person who comes from a country? Like the argument that you represent your country and therefore you're not politically, you're not a polit polit political agent, but that also that country immediately follows through with that promise is, amazingly incoherent to me and yet a, pot, a way to get money um in, in academia um so Rachel I'm sorry that that was uh the opening slide for so long but now we get on to some more slides um so I have four case studies predominantly in the book I also have my first chapter um which is on the kind of run-up to what was keeping the guy became in so it kind of looks from uh the League of Nations um, it runs up to um, going through the Korean War um, and trying to think of how militarized peace actually became a legitimate idea. So how did we shift from this idea that only nation states could have the monopoly on violence to, OK, and the UN? Like, how did that become a legitimate kind of political idea? Um, and so once I kind of do that, that uh, exploration, for those of you who are interested, that's chapter one, um, <laughs> testing the waters. Um, then I move on to my kind of case studies, which um, 
are the first four armed peacekeeping missions um, for the UN. So I begin um, in 1956 with the Suez Crisis, which hopefully everyone's kind of aware of. Um, it was a huge humiliating moment for um, Dag Hammarskjöld, who was then UN Secretary General. He's actually there in uh, in the middle, just above it, which is fun. I'm sure that's <laughs> not what he would have liked. <laughs> Sorry, Dag. Um, so he personally felt um, that he had failed, that the UN had failed, because obviously with the Suez Crisis, that's a tripart invasion of Egyptian sovereignty by Britain, France and Israel. And at the time, Britain and France, well, and currently Britain and France are founding members of the UN. And so he felt it was a rejection for the new, new organisation. You know, the UN was invented a year, like a decade before. Uh, for the new organisation, it's felt like a rejection of one of the foundational principles of the UN, which is Article 2.4, do not breach the sovereignty of another member state. Mm. And by the permanent members, so those who are, have the power for vetoes, Britain and France, that felt like even more of a humiliation. And he had spent most of that year trying to negotiate um, a peaceful uh, resolution to uh, the territorial conflict in that region. So he felt very personally invested. And that's why we kind of see this jump from observer missions, which had been previously the kind of main way that the UN intervened in spaces, less so militarily more so in a kind of observer ceasefire observe, like management sort of way into militarized troops being sent in uh soldiers who had been trained by national battalions who were then deployed and that's kind of a real reinvention of what we think about when we think about conflict um and so these formative peacekeeping commissions i think um, serve as vital case studies for understanding how particular operations fundamentally uh, and contingently, I think as well, I think there's very specific regional contingencies that happen in each of these different missions that lead to the specific ev evolution of peacekeeping into the form it is today. I think there are specific dynamics to Egypt and how um, peacekeeping uh, was shaped and moulded in this first battalion, in this first deployment through this context of the Gaza Strip, negotiating different kinds of ideas of territoriality. Um, but also in this moment of the Cold War, I think it was very contingent on that. So that's why I think it's important for us to actually think about these specific case studies in more detail rather than just what their mandate said. I think it's really interesting for us to dig down into the actual politics of that specific decolonization. Um, and they were continually remaking cultures of peacekeeping and humanitarianism during this time. They were working with the Red Cross in most of these situations. They were developing relationships with state agencies that were humanitarian delivery points. So there was a variety of different kinds of uh, slippages between the militarism aspect and the humanitarianism aspect that is really acute with peacekeeping missions. And they were reworking doctrines of what imperial power and sovereignty could look like during the Cold War, because they were working with colonial powers a lot of the time, or ex-colonial powers, depending on the point at which they were intervening. So often, I think, with decolonization, we think of it as a full stop moment, like a country decolonizes, it becomes independent, full stop. But actually what we learn from these different um, situations, most of the time the UN is intervening in a conflict at a variety of different points in what I would describe as this kind of decolonization moment for that country. So just because a country becomes independent doesn't mean that the process or the, the interference of a colonial power ends. I think for those of you who study neocolonialism, this is not a new argument. Um, and so when we see this specifically in a kind of historical perspective, it's also through the UN that becomes a conduit. So for instance, as an example, in Congo, in Onuk, the Belgian empire um, or the Belgian government uh, uh, withdraws from Congo two weeks um, on the 1st of July. And within two weeks, um, there is a UN peacekeeping mission to restore, uh, to withdraw the Belgian troops because the Belgians had basically refused um, to understand that there was going to be any difference before and after independence. And they were basically just refusing to withdraw their military officials from uh, the Congolese army. Um, in which case, uh, obviously the mandate was for the UN to actually withdraw the Belgians. Like that was the main reason why the Congolese leaders had invited them to join. But very quickly the UN realized they couldn't recruit enough staff in order to keep Congo running as they felt should have been running at that point because so many Belgian white settlers had fled during the conflict. So they re-employed them and so they became UN officials. And so the ex-colonial officials became re-invited into the roles that they had been withdrawn from. So we see this continually. That's not just the only example. It happened in 
UNF actually becomes the main pattern across all of them is that the UN actively employs the withdrawing colonial power to maintain peace and to maintain stability, because that ultimately is the goal that they perceive for this PCP project. Um, and so all of these different kinds of missions, as I try to look across them, have a variety of different continuities um, across them, but all, each of them obviously are also very unique in their own ideas. So for instance, um, auntie, which they also turned as auntie, like your aunt, like in a kind of really like overtly paternalistic patronizing way, um, was the first UN territorial administration. Um, and that's in West Papua. Uh, and that was specifically a situation where there was this direct process of complicity with a recolonizing power. But in this case, it was Indonesia. And so they were pacifying in the Indonesian expansion into empire. And those of you who study East Timor, it's very, very parallels, with, incredible parallels with East Timor. But West Papua is in the early 1960s, and they still remain on the ground um, in West Papua. So it's it's worth having a little Google um, of that situation and getting, getting active um, for the decolonizing of West Papua. But again, this idea that the Cold War was the greatest and then global insecurity was the greatest priority led to this situation where the recolonization of a state was more important and potentially the best solution at the time for the UN leadership than the self-determination of the population because that could provo provoke political dispute that could lead to people ending up supposedly becoming communists which was ultimately obviously the main fear. So the physical nature of these mission deployments empowered mid-level staff it authorized them to take decisions on the ground in these varieties of different contexts uh, that would uh, otherwise be outside of their purview um, as technocrats. Um, and so mid-level officials were faced with interacting, negotiating, collaborating with, recruiting these ex-colonial powers. So British, Belgian and Dutch are the main ones that I look at. Um, and the intricacies of these different kinds of political and economic legacies that were weathered, but also expanded upon by the UN in these spaces. So also additionally, these territorial disputes erupted at different points in these populations decolonization history, as I mentioned. So Egypt had been nominally independent um, from Britain three decades before the Suez crisis. The Congo crisis developed, as I mentioned, just a fortnight after Congolese Independence Day. West Papua was still colonized by the Dutch when the anti-mission arrived. And then by the time they left, they had allowed for the Indonesians to recolonize. And Cyprus was three years post-independence and precariously peaceful by December 1963, when conflict uh, developed and the UN was invited in the following year. And so the heterogeneity of these sovereignty disputes faced by the UN peacekeeping mission during decolonization presented a variety of different kinds of logistical and diplomatic challenges in an increasingly hostile geopolitical environment. And as the organization's global position grew, so we can see here, this is a, a moment of growth for the UN going from that kind of difficult early period into its adolescent years. So it's really de developing from being 10 years old as an organization really trying to expand its value into a much more confident and assertive organization in Congo, and then experiencing a series of controversies due to that expansion, due to that militarized growth and that idea that they could really be a lot more of a con confident militarizing force in a conflict itself. And that leading to a kind of pushback or a, a return of some of the potential currency that they had been building with the first earlier, supposedly very successful missions to Egypt. This is a picture of the incredibly happy uh, UN official Jalal Abdo, who um, was uh, the UN administrator in West Papua. It's one of my favourite photos of a peacekeeper. It's so funny to me. Um, so grumpy and there's so many flowers. Um, <laughs> I just use it all the time. It's just it's a contrast. It's so funny to me. Also, the guy at the back looks like a chef. Or like a kind of a waiter. So I'm not entirely sure what was going on there. Yeah, it's really funny. Um, so what, what can peacekeeping histories reveal about colonial continuities and international rule is kind of the main question. Um, and then grounded in this kind of technocratic exceptionalism and a policy of anti-communism, mid-level bureaucrats took inspiration often instinctively from these imperial administrations to establish this stability. Um, the UN Secretary General recruited these mid-level um, officials from a variety of uh, from a variety of past positions, but I argue that 
this became an epistemic um, liberal internationalist a community. They shared similar ideas of liberal internationalism, despite that their background might have meant that they were previously coming from anti-colonial politics. So for instance, Jalal Abdo here, who is Iranian, um, who was Iranian, he's past now, um, he was a very kind of openly anti-colonial official. He represented um, Iran in the General Assembly. He'd been talking a lot about natural resources being returned to Iran and various other countries. So he was a real kind of outspoken diplomat for anti-colonial politics. He's then recruited um, for the anti-mission where he takes a leadership official position. And he argues that West Papuans are not intellectually capable of political independence. They can't psychologically understand like their own like governance like there's just no capacity for governance even despite the fact there are ongoing protests in West Papua at this time and the UN is actively suppressing them so there's pretend they're, they're imposing a colonial rule which prevented um uh protests in March that hadn't been kind of approved by the state and they were just like not approving any of the protests so there was this this kind of continual issue in his internal reports where he said, well, we haven't had any protests. So there's no political capacity of these people while simultaneously the other side, he's like denying protests, the right to protest. So um, it's really fascinating, like having an insight into these archives. And I do think that's the value of history is often when we're thinking about um, what these officials do and how they position themselves, obviously they've, they have, can have complicated politics. They can have these moments of juxtaposition and that, in this moment of decolonization is fascinating to me because it tells us more about these internal hierarchies, the fact that there were still racialized imaginaries of Pacific communities. So West Papua is the other half of um, Papua New Guinea, and it's just north of Australia. Um, and so it's part of the Pacific communities. And obviously um, a lot of the communities there were dealing with being racialized um, in the same way that a lot of uh, countries and African communities were being racialized at that time. So there was this kind of solidarity across there. And so fundamentally the book tracks the peaks and troughs of these mid-level bureaucrats and their power. So it's not arguing that they went in every time and they were at 100% peak colonial official power from start to finish. But it argues that they have often been neglected and understood as passive um, in these interventions or even puppets. Um, and I think by researching and actually understanding the granular levels and the guises, the technocratic guise that they often used in these spaces to justify that what they were doing was independent or impartial or neutral, using the language of humanitarian principles in order to conceal explicitly political decision making. I think that's incredibly important for us to understand how they fluctuated in how they made room to maneuver in spaces that were often very constrained for them and how their agency expanded as well as constrained in different geopolitical contexts. And I think understanding that as them as historical subjects is just important as understanding nation state officials. I'm very aware that I've talked for quite a long time and it would be great. How much time have I got? You can have 10 minutes more if you want. Oh my God, okay. <laughs> Okay, so, what's the UN? <laughs> I could talk about this for days. Um, beyond a diplomatic forum, so I kind of touched on this, like, the, the, I think, like, I, I really do end up discussing this a lot with uh, UN historians, is, like, it's incredibly limiting to conceive of the UN simply as a diplomatic forum, just to conceive of it as the General Assembly, the Secretary General. Um, the secretariat, this kind of imaginary of the headquarters, and actually understanding the UN is like a myriad of different functions, allowing us to really understand how the forum itself can provide a space for anti-colonial activism and politics. So there have been incredible kind of human rights victories through these spaces, through hard-won activism. So for instance, if you're looking at the sanctions that were imposed on South Africa during the apartheid situation, I would argue it came 20 years too late, but it happened. And those sanctions were fundamentally very important to the US then pivoting in the late eighties. So we have examples of anti-colonial politics and anti-racist politics being, and you know, the forums being progressive in these spaces and actually being able to kind of think about marginalized or minority rights. But what I'm interested in is specifically about how these ideas, these conversations, these arguments then are translated into the UN as a staffing like mechanism in, a, in of itself. So how there are 
I think there is a huge amount of power for those who belong and are recruited and are employed by the UN. And they often become this like invisible black box whenever you think about learning about the UN as an organisation. It's often the member state representatives that we talk about, or if at, at best we talk about the Secretary General. And so I think during decolonisation, there's a really interesting kind of conversation where these field officials actually are being acknowledged in the international press as like political agents of their own right. Um, they're in these sites of diplomatic power in the post-war world. And often peacekeepers themselves help to reframe conflict as this stabilizing solution. So this idea that it was peaceable to wage war in a particular kind of way, that arms were the solution in this moment. Instead of confirming the belief that post-Cold War peacekeeping missions have kind of strayed from this apolitical idea. So sometimes uh, decolonizing peacekeeping missions are framed as a golden age. Um, lots of positivist scholars who work on peacekeeping, uh, especially post 1990s. So a lot of people will talk to you about Yugoslavia and Rwanda when we're thinking about peacekeeping. And then there's a referral of how it's been corrupted. So there's a crisis ongoing in peacekeeping and this is new, this is a new crisis, the SEA crisis, the abuse scandals, all of these things. This is, this is historically a real pivot and a change from the wonderful peacekeeping that we used to have bless you, during decolonization. Um, whereas actually, I suppose quite a lot of my work is trying to debunk that idea and to try and argue that actually this is an intensification um, and expansion of those powers that were already fundamental to a competing identity um, during this kind of Cold War era and that they were playing an integral role actually in perpetuating racial hierarchies, international interference and technocratic supremacy within these very vulnerable spaces of transition at this time. And peacekeepers' armed presence in conflict context not only transformed the context and conduct of war, their mandate also provoked a reimagining of peace and global governance as a whole. They expanded out of international headquarters into the host state. The UN peacekeeping staff reconfigured expectations of the diplomatic organization by undertaking decisions from the front line. So they weren't just kind of a vehicle for which the UN was making decisions at the top level. These were actual individuals who were empowered to make decisions about the future of, of these states from the ground. And this devolution of organizational power complicated traditional ideas of the international core and periphery. Um, centering global south um, spaces as we've talked about and populations in knowledge production and the geopolitical discourses at this time. And so these interactions with regional politicians, host communities, as well as their colleagues back in the UN placed them as this uniquely influential position. They were empowered as gatekeepers and as a flow through which information and knowledge was legitimized within this new international peace and security industry. And so from its origins, the UN uh, leadership characterized the organization, its employees fundamentally as humanitarian, impartial, non-aligned and expert. And these apolitical credentials encouraged both global south and ex-colonial powers this kind of specific unity to appeal for uh, UN-led peacekeeping missions to resolve post-colonial conflicts. Often reluctantly, but it still became, it was still ultimately the most popular solution because they provided the intervention power that a superpower, for instance, if you were looking to the Soviet Union or the US for support, the UN really offered um, a reluctantly, but less overtly political, ideological um, support which obviously was the marketing idea. Obviously it was very anti-communist. So however, UN international staff, civilian and military deployed to conflict contexts were not apolitical actors as advertised. Their previous career experiences, their anxiety over reputation to the UN. So that becomes a huge aspect of UN peacekeeping. It's protecting the organization above everything else. And I think this is something that's potentially very familiar to those of you who work on NGO work. So the the effort that's put on managing that reputation, but also future management. So that continuation of value. Um, and obviously for those of us who work in humanitarianism, you're often kind of hoping or supposedly the ideal is you hope for redundancy, right? You, you hope that you're, there is no need for humanitarian intervention fundamentally, but the whole idea and the whole logic of your peacekeeping was sustaining and expanding. It was inherently a kind of growth based project. They sought to expand more, grow more, become more, um, integral to political decision-making in all of these spaces. 
Um, and so fundamentally that interventionist idea was like, well, let's, let's find another environment that we can intervene in and actually to extend peacekeeping missions. So for instance, if we look at Cyprus, if we look at the Middle East, if we look um, at many of the different early peacekeeping missions, those are protracted missions. Mm -hmm. Their management is built in from the very beginning. If you install a partition, a territorial partition, peacekeepers make it so that they have to continue managing that ceasefire. There's no kind of polit polit political resolution to the problem. They're just, and in one peacekeeper's idea, this was called putting it in the fridge. And this idea is that justice is deferred. Someone else can deal with the political resolution. But in the meantime, you've got 75 years of a peacekeeper buffer zone. And that keeps the UN sustained. Like that keeps the value of the organization sustained. Um, so what does this tell us about the relationship between peacekeepers and civilians? And this is something I'm increasingly interested in. My next book is going to be more about this. I'm, I'm going to be braver because I think in this book, I wasn't as brave methodologically as I could have been about trying to identify. And it's actually very, it's very difficult. I suppose that's something we can talk about. It's actually quite difficult, especially with historical sources, to find information about how civilians interacted with, but also thought of the peacekeeping mission itself beyond small instances. And that's definitely something I'm trying to be braver with and in, in interrogating. Um, and so when I'm thinking about it in this book, it's much more in the sense of how those interactions were often um, seen through the lens of that colonial relationship. So it's very much kind of <coughs> paternalistic ideas. You've got Ralph Bunch there on the left. He was um, an African-American um, representative of the UN who's very, very high up at the UN. He's basically, he's been described often as the father of peacekeeping. He won the Nobel Peace Prize for resolving the Middle East crisis, which we all, <laughs> <sighs> thank you, Ralph. Um, you did such good work. Um, and so unfortunately, uh, he also had a uh, racial hierarchy. So he himself was very much marched at Selma. He was very involved in African-American civil rights. But when it came to African rights uh, and self-determination he was again very much Jala like Jalal Abdo who very much thought that people were not yet ready for uh, independence um he didn't really set any kind of rule for what that would be but they just weren't ready you know the vibes weren't there so it was very much a kind of vibes based decolonization um going on the trusteeship um council with him at this time and so there was very much this kind of denial of uh, political independence in much of these spaces whilst also interacting with them. So we see these photos and I've started using photos a lot more because I think it is a kind of very rare instance where we actually really get to kind of have a brief insight into these these kind of physical interactions between peacekeepers and civilians. But obviously locals were also employed by the UN as administrative staff drivers. Uh, translators, healthcare workers, many more acting as intermediaries. And so for those who disagreed with the mission or sought to criticize its practices, um, those who use protests, petitions, etc., cetera, um, those have often been silenced in this kind of uh, much more broader story of peacekeeping. So you often see uh, in the official reporting is very much a kind of dismissal attitude towards any form of criticism and, and reputational damage potentially. Um, so although I focus on peacekeeping practices, I'm also hoping that another thing that the book does is to really reveal those political activities. Um, so yes, so that's the book cover. I'm pleased with it for an academic book. Who was? Um, it's been out for a while now, so it's a bit weird talking about it because I've kind of moved on to multiple other projects. Um, but the paperback is about to be out, so it's about to be almost affordable. <laughs> like it's currently, do not buy it, <laughs> and soon it will be if you want to. Um, I think it will be like under twenty-five pounds as a paperback, so it's still pretty brutal. But it's eighty-five pounds currently, so disgusting. Um, so don't buy it. I think Christina has a copy in her office, so if anyone wants <laughs> to borrow, it's in a library. It's in a library. library. Yeah, in a library. Which honestly might make me cry a little bit later, but maybe not right now. Um, so these are the key findings that I think are particularly kind of stand out about this book and this kind of contribution. Um, I think also fundamentally, it's a constant battle with the IR and political science scholars to actually recognize historical peacekeeping missions as being part of the history of peace, or like being part of contemporary peacekeeping, like there's not actually being this kind of Cold War, post-Cold War division 
um, that things were really, really easy and simple, not violent, demilitarized, kind of defanged idea of what peacekeeping was during the Cold War. And then suddenly we have the 1990s, the end of the Cold War, and everything gets a bit crazy, you know? Like it just suddenly it becomes really interesting and complex and we have a billion books written about peacekeeping. And there's so much interesting work that's been done on critical engagement with peacekeeping about, like Marsha Henry is a bit amazing work on the end of peacekeeping recently, which is about martial identities and race and gender and all these incredible themes. And I'm like, let's bring it back. Let's bring that chronology back. These aren't new um, systems. These aren't new structures. And actually, I think they're fundamentally baked in to the identity and the structures of peacekeeping from the very beginning. And that's kind of where I'm going now with the project is very much building upon this as peacekeeping actually led to, a, became a bridge between the colonial world and the post-colonial world in providing that real fundamental fuel-based link of administrative continuities, um, racial continuities, cultural continuities. But actually, I'm now thinking about how we can really understand how the actual identity of peacekeeper itself is ground in those kinds of inequalities, the actual ideological project is fundamentally gendered and racialized. So yeah, that's that's maybe where we'll end it. Thank you. So thank you very much. Would you like to do something? Yeah. Else? Should have bought. Oh, I think I have bought that. Okay, that's fine. Because I don't have the book. But imagine that oh, we do not have not like um, the book I just meant for writing notes. Would you like to sit here? Christina said that she was going to <laughs> okay, so I think that we have 35 minutes for questions. So, okay, I can see also some hands. So, it yes. Was awesome if you could tell me your name and a little bit about like what you work on and stuff. So, Siobhan. Um, hi, I'm Siobhan and I work in the history department. I'm working on the history of the Red Cross and the Soviet Union. Oh, fast. So, my question's a bit predictably about the social as well. Yeah. So, what is ask about tensions? that existed with this anti-communist thrust of peace yeah. in, um, and the reconfiguration of the UN in sort of mid to late 1950s with the increasing influence of socialist states. So I think the USSR becomes the second biggest contributor to the, US, um, to the UN budget in the late 50s. Yeah. So I wanted to ask like, what what's the role or reaction of socialist states to the um, to the process that you're talking about? And also the great talk, and I can't wait to be done. <laughs> Thank you. Should, do you want to collect or shall I just respond? This is up to you. Maybe because we've got 35 minutes, I'll just quickly respond. Sometimes I find it difficult to hold so many questions in my head and I just get distracted by shiny things that have to like pop up in my head when I'm talking. So yes, absolutely, and great question. It sounds like a great project as well. Um, so yes, absolutely. So um, there's a complicated kind of process where the Soviet Union recognises that the UN is increasingly kind of shifting towards the anti-communist um, allegiances but this is very much field-based rather than the kind of diplomatic negotiation so when we're thinking about field-based stuff Yugoslavia which is non-aligned obviously at the kind of beginning of the period I'm looking at Yugoslavia do donate troops um, not a huge amount of troops but they are on the ground and there's that kind of complicate even though they're non-aligned because they're kind of associated and they have the socialist kind of guise a little bit and so that becomes the only instance where there's actually an East Bloc or potentially even framed as an East Bloc party that's actually physically on the ground. And there's no UN peacekeeping leadership that are from any kind of socialist affiliated countries. But the Soviet Union is very angry about that. And they talk and, and a lot of East Bloc countries constantly are talking about it being unfair that they're rejected. And so the main reason is, is that there is technically no superpower and permanent member so per most for the most part there are no permanent members who are allowed to donate troops to peacekeeping so that lines up that there's supposed to be a flat rule which is us britain france china russia oh my god soviet union all, all prevented from these early formative missions and so you end up with the donation of most troops coming from middle power nations or non-aligned nations um, and I, we can talk for days about, um, uh, we can talk if anyone wants to talk about like kind of the donate, the types of na national kind of roles that different countries play and how that's obviously racialized and has hierarchies as well. But definitely, and I think there's obviously also 
I start the book with the Korean War, like I think about the Korean War, and obviously there was a huge boycott of the Soviet Union during that period because they sought to donate troops to the Korean War um, as one of the battalions of the UN command, and that was rejected on the basis that they were communists and that they were that, that wasn't acceptable because obviously in the Korean War they were fighting the communists. Um, and that became a reason for a boy, you know, they were boycotting at that period, so they weren't able to kind of reject uh the UN uh command structure so there became this kind of tension definitely about peacekeeping and the so and the kind of second world from the very from the very beginning and I mean they were even protesting that they weren't able to send observers to Palestine in 48 so there's there's been a conversation about it but I think it's also the Soviet Union recognizing that it was a space where they required that diplomatic exchange um, but it is, it's a really interesting kind of, there's a, there's a book to be written about, so if you want a postdoc project, there's a book to be written about, like, the second world and peacekeeping, 100%, by someone who has language skills, <laughs> and I sadly don't have them. Thank you. Chloe? Hi, I'm Chloe, I'm in uh, the last few months of the PhD. Oh, congrats. Know, so I'm working on settler colonialism in Palestine and kind of the issues of mobility and access to rights um, in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip and uh, in Jerusalem. So I would like to flash forward mm -hmm. until today. Mm -hmm. I'm also from Lebanon. Uh, the situation in Lebanon is, of course, on my mind every day. And I would like to know, I mean, first I'm going to just quickly set the context between the Israeli border and the Latani River and the existence of the Irish peacekeeping forces mm -hmm. who are working in tandem with uh, UNIFIL, which is the United Nation, Nations interim force in Lebanon, yeah. which is kind of ironic, interim, because they've been there since 1978. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So kind of along the lines of what you were saying about deferred justice. Um, and I would like to know what your thoughts are or learning from the lessons of the past, yeah. if there are any lessons that we can learn from, you know, your book and the history of UN peacekeeping forces and what kind of that tells us about the future of peacekeeping yeah. in general, you know, given the fact that today we have these Irish peacekeeping forces who are refusing to leave, who are refusing yeah. to adhere to the Israeli demands. Um, and like up until two days ago, the Israeli forces are now right at their doorstep, right okay. at their camp. Yeah. Um, and if it's kind of, if you can give us anything that kind of gives us some solace for the future, or is it all, is there just no real hope for the legitimacy of peacekeeping forces in the future? Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, I can do that. So yeah, I'm, an, ab I'm, I'm an abolitionist, yeah. I'm afraid, mm. when it comes to peacekeeping. I think the harm mm. that is, um, and I think that's what the next product is, it's baked into the logic of what peacekeeping is itself. So there are obvious um, examples in the past, also often of Irish peacekeepers. So I think, it, you know, the Irish um, peacekeepers often do kind of violate um, UN command in like, so we see this in Katanga in Congo with the siege of Janoville. Some of you may have seen the film um, where there are disputes between the command of a UN mission and the troops themselves, like the battalions, because they're in an example. So we, we also know, obviously, within the controversies of Yugo, uh, the Yugoslavia situation in the 1990s, that troops were asked to withdraw and that there were disputes at that moment. Um, in Rwanda, similarly, you read the memoirs of these peace people and they say it wasn't like everyone was just like happy days about the instructions that was being given. So I think we have to think complicatedly about internal tensions within the mission troops, just as much as we think about internal tensions within administrations, which is, I think, sometimes we're more, more attentive to. But a lot of the time with um, PTP missions, there obviously are different national alliances, different politics. Um, obviously, Ireland has been quite aligned as a government with Palestinian statehood and self-determination. So I think there's inherently like a really complicated and interesting story about their presence and purpose as function as peacekeepers on the ground there that feels like um an environment where that kind of political relationship is bound to kind of create tensions between that military and martial identity as peacekeepers you see the un as your commander and then you also have this kind of personal political relationship with the actual conflict itself and it's not particularly unique, like that happens repeatedly throughout. It's just quite interesting that, that it's being tested and rejected because often those are being contested, like these conversations are happening, but ultimately that martial identity wins out, like the compliance with the command goes through. Um, or there's a massive controversy as there was in Congo and it leads to kind of a massive reputational crisis for the US because if it looks like it's lost control of its troops, 
that becomes like a huge reputational crisis um, for future peacekeeping. So I think there's type, kind of two aspects to your question, which are like kind of what is the future of peacekeeping? And I'm like, fundamentally, I think it's a violent process. I don't think that I think it's incredibly harmful on communities. And I think it does more harm than good. And that um, work on contemporary peacekeeping has demonstrated that over and over again and I think that like fundamentally hopefully what I'm going to be able to do soon is prove that that was that lineage and that that kind of logic that harmful logic has always been there mm. but I also think the question about this particular context in Lebanon is really fascinating because the UN has been there for so long and in so many different forms mm. because yeah. UNIFIL is not I mean you've got the first UN peacekeeping mission is still technically there the true supervision of observer mission um there are multiple different forms that the UN has intervened militarily in that space, and they are participants in a conflict. And the more and more we kind of conceive of them as temporary, which is exactly like you say with the title, I don't think we're thinking about how much they've influenced the dynamics of the actual conflict itself. So, but I really appreciate your question. I think it's a really interesting context for those of you who don't know it's worth Googling yesterday. Yeah, there is a question in the back. Yeah, perfect. Um, you made us out ourselves, and you probably don't have a clue how much bureaucrats. So, <laughs> um, a few questions, but one particularly in terms of um, how would you appraise contemporary protection of civilians, just based mm. on your reflections on the use of force by peacekeepers? Yeah. Um, and then I'm going to ask you a little bit about your position of abolitionism. Because sure. What do you have in mind? Yeah. as alternatives um and then if there's time i've got more but <laughs> i'll let other people great cool okay. so yeah protection of civilians is i think the the argument is often like it there are good intentions to it so i the the level of harm that's committed by peacekeeping officials and the level of harm rather than protection of civilians harm to civilians is what i'm most interested in so rather than there being this focus on the intentionality of what the mission actually does I'm more interested in the scholarship that's been examining the level of not just like physical harm and gendered harm in the way that I think makes the the, the reports of sexual abuse and exploitation, but actually the level of um, systematic kind of change that is influenced onto an environment. So me and Christina recently did a panel about how intervention fundamentally shapes and changes and affects uh, in economies in spaces of intervention and and then obviously the withdrawal of that is immediately very very disruptive or destabilizing um and in a lot of my work recently i've been thinking about the limitations like how political independence is limited through the peacekeeping or host population so how the intervention itself imposes an emergency justification and prevents civil liberties from lots of different communities and obviously we have various kinds of examples of environmental damage so with Haiti for instance and the cholera epidemic so there's a variety of different examples I think we're at now where the scale of harm that is committed by international troops abroad by those under kind of UN umbrella has reached such a scale that it's it's fundamentally very very difficult to imagine that it is anything other than unsustainable and I, I work with scholars who work on protection of civilians as very much a community built process so actually civilians doing that work themselves and a lot often a lot of that work is protecting themselves against peacekeeping forces mm -hmm. so a colleague Lou Pingio works on police peacekeeping she just wrote a book called police peacekeeping which is about the Haiti mission and so much of the work is on how police peacekeepers at the time um, were heavily militarized as well were focusing on this ideology of gangs or this focus on gangs so much there was such an interrogation and surveillance of the civilian population that the civilian population were actually creating communities NGOs of themselves to and sustain kind of strategies in order to protect themselves against this much more kind of oppressive um, militarized intervention that basically was there for like over a decade so protection of civilians I think it's really really fascinating I think there's really interesting scholarship being done on actually how it's grass grassroots civilian protection seems to be the least affected by these kinds of systemic interventionist um, politics <laughs> and alternatives I mean I would just recommend uh, the end of peacekeeping um, so Marsha Henry's recent book is um, kind of makes the case for abolitionism 
um, and also does a really fantastic, for anyone who writes about peacekeeping, her instruction is like the perfect lit review assessment of the past like 25 years of scholarship on peacekeeping. So um, yeah, I would really recommend reading that. And I think the argument not necessarily being like, I think when we think about abolition and abolitionism within relation to policing, the argument being, this is the only solution we've got what are the alternatives if we don't have an amazing plan therefore we can't abolish this harmful thing I think has kind of been I mean scholars like Ruth Gilmore have kind of demonstrated that actually alternatives have been posited and, and like suppressed throughout like the past hundreds of years so trying to actually look at those solutions and not silence them instead but yeah I appreciate the question thank you uh, yeah my name is Chibran I'm doing a master's in uh, humanitarianism and cultural response Great. Um, so my question is, is that um, you kind of uh, showed that the UN peacekeeping sort of project was this idea of legitimate states and illegitimate states, i.e. Yeah. liberal democratic being legitimate and any sort of variation of communism being illegitimate. So I just wanted to ask, like, to what extent did the people um, you know, running the, the UN peacekeeping organisation or uh, you know, sort of mission to what extent did they actually believe that, or was it actually just another way to sort of exert power mm. and maintain colonial, you know, dominance through the battle of, you know, liberal democracies being legitimate states? I, I, I think they did believe it. I think there's lots of liberals out there. It's scary. Um, yeah, no, hundred percent. I think you know, I think people like Ralph. But that's why it's more interesting to me that there's very much this, uh, and I, I. When I the book went through peer review, um, I got a comment from a reader being like, you've got to put a paragraph in about good intentions. The fact that people went in with good intentions, you've got to, you've got to just, you can't just rail against the whole book. You've got to like have a paragraph being like, you understand. So I have a paragraph where I say they had good intentions, but that's very violent. And that's still, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that in colonial historiography has shown us that lots of people who commit violent acts have often had good intentions. Um, yeah, I mean, anyone who's ever worked on civilization or any kind of colonial history will have that. So we do, I think a lot of the situation, especially people like Ralph Bunch and Abdo, who had, you know, very politically active supposedly kind of pseudo anti-colonial because also there wasn't one definition of what anti-colonialism was or is or could be you know multiple different disputes about what the what self-determination looked like like all of these different debates ongoing I think the thing with the UN is that it refused to create space for that debate in these in these environments in these youth country colonies so at the end uh, in West Papua for instance there was a real rejection of giving the community that had been colonized by the Dutch for over like 70 years at that point, any moment uh, or time to really consider what or, or discuss with one another, debate what potential options they could look like, because there were so many different ways that their state could progress politically. But instead, the UN was like not allowing or enabling that kind of level of debate or understanding that part of a liberal democracy is dispute and that you're allowed to kind of disagree with one another. And that's a good thing and that should be encouraged, but that dispute was conceived of as conflict. And therefore any kind of potential escalation was would be seen for them as them not kind of holding the fort, creating the stability. So it was such a self <laughs> very self-centered way of thinking about statehood, absolutely. But I do think ultimately it was about this idea of stability and that being in itself like the liberal state provides stability. We, understand that um, in these liberal democracies, obviously this is also a context where the CIA is running around and disrupting so-called liberal democracies and kind of acknowledging that any kind of non-communist state is acceptable as a democracy at this time. And I'm not saying that the UN was totally on board with all of those kinds of actions, but I do think there was definitely this kind of decision making about like what is the most stable form of governance. And that's why they often made collaborations with ex-colonial powers, because they said they know the language, they know the system, they know the people to, to in their own way, and they're going to be able to provide us um, that stability, that law and order that we need in order to say that we function as conflict resolution. So therefore, then peace becomes the absence of violence rather than justice. <clears throat> and that's why studying peace and conflict studies is so important. <laughs>
Now, yeah. Um, thank you, Margaret. <laughs> that was a really great talk. It's lovely to hear um, kind of the bird's eye view pieces of your books. I know I've, I've yeah. heard like different aspects of your work being presented before, but really interesting to hear the core argument presented. Um, so I'm really interested in like the different politics of the different UN mm. peacekeeping missions. Mm. It's not a history I'm very familiar with, but I know like the example of the Irish peacekeepers in Congo, and you mentioned how there were tensions there. Mm. So I wonder if you could speak a bit more about like what were the different troop contributing countries in each peacekeeping mission? And like, oh, can you yeah. say, oh, sorry, is that a, <laughs> that a annoying question? It's like but, 12 like, in every mission. <laughs> No, but I'm joking. Would Sorry. you say um, between the different missions, like, yeah. are they distinct enough that you can see different kind of political yeah. objectives? Yeah. Or or would you say it's more important to think of like the overriding UN peacekeeping, like the construction of an ideology of UN yeah. peacekeeping over the time period that you're looking at? No, totally. Sorry for being nasty. <laughs> Love Maria. Maria has seen this project from a very early stage so it's scary so always always scary to have people who've yeah like Rasheen has permission to fall asleep throughout this entire paper because she's read it so many times um absolutely and I think that's more the next book which is thinking and being more attentive to those those differences and I think absolutely I think this thinks about um potentially more the civilian administration and that's mm. why so it's less about the troops right, okay. it's just less about the troops mm -hmm. um just on the basis of scope because i'm thinking about those mid-level bureaucrats is really my kind of main characters in the book but absolutely there being kind of shifts and trends in different national makeup so they're being very much from the beginning um there's fear within the un that this was going to be accused and criticized for being a neo-colonial project like Dag Hammarskjöld being really anxious about that especially with Congo and going out of his way to recruit from neighboring African countries in order to try and <laughs> from his perspective he was like this is the best way to try and ameliorate the women and you know I'm saying it's still an intervention on a wage by the UN and that all of the UN leadership in Congo um, civilian leadership were for the majority from Nordic or Western aligned countries. So you had very much this hierarchy within the troop battalions being often um, a mixture of Global South contributing nations, but actually the leadership and the force commanders often being from either white or Western countries. Um, so yeah, there definitely being a shifting dynamic when Uthan, who is the next Secretary General, comes in. Um, and he himself being from Myanmar and having this kind of very uh, overt anti-colonial position and him being you know, spoke at Bandung had this whole like kind of relationship with a lot of different anti-colonial nations but also throughout this period I mean the slide the timeline side so many new countries come into being because from Congo kind of being the beginning period until like 1964 there's like 50 new members of the General Assembly so that's great for the UN because it's suddenly all these new countries that aren't permanent members of the UN are suddenly available to donate. So there is a natural trend towards um, Global South contributing nations mm -hmm. and then loads of Nordic countries who just dominate heavily throughout this period and Ireland. So there's a, there, and then also Canada, but pretending that it's not because Canada is officially not supposed to be there because it's too big. So it does housekeeping. So it often does like signals or like, which is, and they arm them. So it's not even pretending. <laughs> like, which is like, oh, Canada's also there. Um, always, all the time. Um, so there's the, the P5 members are heavily involved in resourcing and financing these kinds of missions, but actually the bodies on the ground and the politics of your body being the front line was often Global South contributing nations, absolutely. And I do think that changed the dynamics and the kinds of relationships. And we can talk about that more later, perhaps. But absolutely, in my next book, I'm thinking about that specifically with the UNF mission, so the first UN PCP mission, mm -hmm. and about how difficult it is, especially the first time, to create an international military that's 10 different national mm -hmm. battalions. You're, one of which was called the Danor mission because it was the Danish and the Norway mixed together. So that's kind of a unique situation where you've got actual troops mixed as a battalion rather than it being kind of these discrete national battalions. But I'm fascinated by this like cosmopolitan militarism mm. and like 
the, the hypothesis for the book is its masculinity, that they hype, they encourage this hypermasculine recreation, identity, interactions with one another, this entire culture of masculine, hyper-masculinity exaggerated as a gelling force. Because they're like, you all speak different languages, you're all from different backgrounds, completely different ideas of what PCP is and your training is, but you're all men. So let's get a boxer to come visit you on the front line and you can all do shooting practice and competitions on the front line of a conflict. Insane. Football matches, like all of it, like hyper-masculine recreation and courage because that was like this idea of the similarity that would really bring them together. So absolutely, and hopefully that's something I'm going to be more attentive to are those kind of inter-troop tensions and conflicts and juicy stuff. Yeah. We have an online question. Would you mind reading that aloud? Uh, of course. Uh, they said, you mentioned the need to see the UN as more than the Security Council or General Assembly. And they were hoping uh, you could advise on the relations between peacekeeping missions and their heavy place in the UN structure yeah. and other uh, UN agencies, either developmental or humanitarian. Uh, they said there isn't always much love between them, but what is the history of their relation and power within the UN? Do you know who said that? It's in Imre. Imre. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> It's like God, like, I don't know where the camera is. The camera's over. <laughs> um, that's a really great question. And um, a creation of DPKO, which is the Department of Peacekeeping Operations. I was going to look to you because it was like, you're my person. Uh, <laughs> DPKO was created in 1940, uh, 1994. So there's now there is a Department of Peacekeeping, but pre-1994, there wasn't kind of a distinct department. So all peacekeeping decision-making was from the Secretary General directly. So the Secretary, that's why I work so much on the Secretary General kind of politics of it all, because they were very personally involved in the decision making. Um, indeed, often kind of we have Article 99, which is the Secretary General is able to bring to the Security Council a situation which he seeks to escalate into a peacekeeping mission. So there is a huge amount of kind of personal uh, core secretariat involvement and the politics of it all mm -hmm. is peacekeeping being baked into that central decision making um club they called themselves like the club um of men who kind of lived on a particular floor of the un headquarters um and so there is absolutely this uh division this, this growing division for peacekeeping because peacekeeping becomes siloed a little bit into its own department becomes a huge beast of itself but there was definitely at the time i'm looking at um, much more of an intertwined engagement. So you see direct relationships and reporting from the officials I'm looking at to the Secretary General, like they're talking to each other directly. Ralph Bunch is based in the club at, in the UN New York headquarters, but he's regularly making field trips and going to the ground and stuff. So that's why I suppose it's a very interesting period of peacekeeping because it feels so personal to the actual identity of the decision-making and Face, public facing aspects of those UN leadership at the time. Um, and it's interesting that it's been how it's changed, I suppose, and how it's been sidelined um, in the kind of Kofi Annan um, period when he started to make different kinds of statements about what peacekeeping would be. So there is a kind of shift in what the idea is of what peacekeeping can be as it becomes its own department. Um, but yeah, during my period at least, it's very much integral to Secretariat. But thank you. Do we have any other questions? No. Okay. Any other questions? We have 10 minutes left. Can you screenshot so we can see the names? Yep. Yeah. You have follow up. Yeah, just um I, I, I know that on the on the sea post World War II, um the uh, Americans took a uh, vested interest in maintaining uh, peace and stability in Europe mm. through like a federalist approach. Mm -hmm. would, would you say that perhaps influenced this idea of that that is the way to create stability? Because also Europe has a history of fighting each other for, for, for a very long time and maybe yeah. the modern period is a bit of an aberration in that regard, but I just wondered how much that would have influenced their view on that. Yeah, I mean, there were peacekeeping missions in the League of Nations, so in the First World War kind of period, um, post First World War period. So, but absolutely, like shaping, uh, you know, uh, obviously the US being integral to lots of different ideas of collective security, um, mistakes made, and then the potential of, because 
the League of Nations missions that existed um, in the early 1920s, which were very much kind of born from the fracturing of borders in the First World War, so very similar kind of contexts and questions of territorial disputes, responding with peacekeeping, armed peacekeeping missions of mixed battalions of different nationalities, but not really um, large scale, so very, very small scale and kind of much more like observers, similar kind of as observer styles. And there starts to be these tentative steps towards, so that's kind of what the first chapter looks at, is like these tentative steps towards what peacekeeping could look like and how the structure of a particular UN peacekeeping mission, the way that it becomes evolved by 48 or UNSO, which is that first peacekeeping mission, how that even becomes a consensus format that everyone kind of agrees has naturally evolved at that point. And absolutely, I mean, the US kind of idea of stability I don't think is unique to the US at that time. I think Britain was also, you know, or any uh, any of the countries that had waged and been part of uh, the Second World War, that P5 powers, Soviet Union very heavily involved in crafting the United Nations in 40, you know, 43, 44, 45, because obviously the United Nations was created in 43, and then only kind of was for, like formally constructed in 45 with the San Francisco um, Act. So it's, these are evolving conversations that happen throughout the 40s, but I think, and it's, and I do this too, like starting in 45 is probably wrong. <laughs> like I think, and that's why chapter one kind of, and the more I dug into it, I was like, oh, I probably should have looked at that. And there is interesting work being done on the League of Nations peacekeeping missions and these kinds of non-official, like small P peacekeeping missions that happened before then. So yes, totally, but also it's more complicated than that, is maybe the historian irritating answer. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Kristen. Um, yeah, thanks. That's it from me, Michael. Um, I would be interested to hear more about um, what a kind of, as you put it, like braver approach to methodology mm -hmm. would look like for your second book. Because I always hear about you sort of going to New York to the archives. Yeah. It sounds very gra glamorous. <laughs> Not. It's a basement with no windows <laughs> in New <But> York. <laughs> So you're like, oh my god, I'm in the city that has the most incredible things in it, and you're in a basement. You could be anywhere. You could be at home. No, it's no. I, I love that you think that that's a glamorous experience. I am going for a month next year as well, and I'm ready for the. I'm going to take my vitamin D tablet. Um, Let's collect some questions because we have like six minutes left. Okay. Are there any other questions, person? Hi. Thanks very much. I was wondering, thinking about the, the sort of. You, you're kind of critical of the, the sort of UN um, peacekeeping histories and the, the, the sort of failure to acknowledge the sort of mm -hmm. problematic nature of these anti-colonial figures who were also involved in the United Nations. And I wonder what role the United Nations work played for them in legitimizing their kind of um, anti-colonial struggles in their home countries. Yeah. So, like, what's the trade-off that they're yeah. kind of working within? Yeah, no, absolutely. Do you want to collect or...? Yeah, okay. I don't know. Are there any other questions? Yeah? I just wanted to come back on protection of civilians. Um, and you could say a bit more about... I, I'm not fully really with you on the on the balance of harm. Mm -hmm. um, while I'm with you in, in the sense that it's great that there's more accountability in terms of... How peacekeeping, peacekeeping troops are helping, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I have questions about how you reflect on where there's kind of the direct intervention, which it sounded earlier in your talk that you were sort of had some sympathy with. Um, what, so example, the intervention itself is as an so as an example, um, how would you compare a Rwanda situation with yeah a South Sudan situation? Okay. Understanding that that's not within your within your period. Of yeah, stuff, so. I was going to say I'm a fourteen, fifties girl. But... <laughs> cool. Okay. Absolutely. I think there's a massive legitimacy trade off um, for anti colonial officials. So I think the main, and I, I think the UN's really interest. The UN officials that engage with it are very aware of that as well. So specifically aware of how diplomatically important it is for those middle power nations seeking diplomatic legitimacy, but absolutely for these anti-colonial officials who do very short stints with the UN. So, I mean, you know this because you 
but stuff. But Jalal Abdo only being for a very, very short period of time, only seven months in this period before he goes back to Iranian politics. Um, there's various Gaza, <laughs> Gaza sorry, uh, Plaza, the Plaza no, um, who um, is an official in Cyprus. He um, is, was Ecuadorian president. Then he goes and gets involved in UN peacekeeping and then he returns to Ecuadorian um, politics. So there's lots of different instances where there's this recruitment of from officials who are already really high level politicians or diplomats within their own national context, or they may also have been very highly, like Abdo's being president of the um, General Assembly when they were making debate, when they were doing debates. And stuff. So already existing kind of diplomatic representatives. So I think it's potentially also like a relationship that's being extended for that nation as well, because it's a particular kind of person. It's not just someone who's coming from that country and they're a high level businessman they're specifically like politicians who have held high level of uh, representative powers so absolutely that being a trade-off thing um regarding intervention uh and we have like three minutes so i apologize if it's not the most horrible thing i think there is a fundamental issue with a militarized intervention from a force from an organization that is inherently overtly political in what its decision making is and also that those powers and the intervention, the, the peacekeepers themselves are parties to a conflict. So despite the fact that they kind of try and put them as put themselves as exceptional or kind of remove from the conflict, they are part of the conflict itself. They shape the dynamics and they intensify often. I mean, most of my research is on how they militarize, the excessive, the, the presence of peacekeepers militarizes um, and in, increases often tensions within civilian communities. So there is not only just, there's a separation of conflict, so there are fewer interstate deaths, so there's this kind of the ceasefire freezes the conflict, but the actual militarization of the context continues and is exacerbated because then every aspect of civilian society is totalized within that interventionist environment. So it creates a completely different style, um, like um, experience of a conflict itself because it's extended, it's completely transforms what conflict is from being previously potentially just an interaction between states or civil civil war powers into being an intervention that militarizes and harms civilians on a kind of paternalistic basis so i've just that's where i come from an intervention is i think that there's like a totalizing category to it that level that leads to that level of harm throughout society but I don't expect to win you over. <laughs> like, I, I hope that, yeah, I hope that if you're able to, you can read my book or Marsha's book and then we can continue to discuss because that's part of the fun. Thank you. Thank you. Let's give this thought and please join me to thank Margot for thank your. You. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>